Hi everyone. I am very excited to finally have a violin Bon Musica shoulder rest in my possession. I used to own one of these, but I lost it. I don't know where it went, and I didn't want to buy another one to do this video, and someone just bought one for me. Thank you, Yvette and Steve. I really appreciate it, and I think other people are going to appreciate this video as well. So I love the Bon Musica for several reasons, and I don't love it for several reasons. So let's discuss the pros and the cons first. First and foremost is the versatility of the Bon Musica. It is malleable, it's soft, it's bendable. You can customize it for different body shapes, different violin sizes. It's just extremely versatile and customizable. That's the main plus about the Bon Musica, besides giving great security with this famous hook that it offers. Now the cons of the Bon Musica is just simply that it's, it's bulky, it's heavy, it's a lot of hardware to have on your violin. When it's on your violin, it's hard to put your violin under your arm and have it rest there comfortably because of the big hook. You know, it's just kind of bulky and in the way. That's None of that is a big deal. For comfort, I'd take that trade any time. The biggest con about the Bon Musica is that because of the hook, you have great security, but the hook tends to lock you into one position, which isn't always a benefit. So we're gonna talk about ways to unlock you as much as possible while still enjoying the benefit of this, this the hook. Now the Bon Musica is a wonderful starting point for students who are trying to get a comfortable setup and they just cannot arrive at something comfortable. I often have my students just get a Bon Musica and bend it and mutate it into whatever crazy shape they feel like they need. Get used to that feeling of comfort, settle into something so that the chaos kind of calms down, and then maybe at a later time we transition to a more minimalist shoulder rest, or maybe not. Sometimes this is the shoulder rest for life. Now, the first thing I want you to do, if you have a Bon Musica in your possession, brand new, out of the box, I want you to enlarge this space between the feet. And that is done by bending this side. You see how that's got a, a crease in it? This is the chest side. And they refer to, to this piece of metal here as the retaining bracket. It's going to be really tight if you have a a hefty full-size violin, which I do. Like, it made me nervous. So, um, go ahead and bend that side a little bit wider. You want it just kind of nice and snug on your violin, but not choking it in a death grip. Now, let me go through each of the movable parts on your Bon Musica, and I'll describe briefly what axis they're going to be used to adjust, and then I'll go ahead and Put it on my violin and show you a few things. Okay, so first let's talk about the screw that goes on your shoulder side. You'll notice that the screw on the shoulder side is much shorter than the screw on the chest side. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, we don't need as long of a screw on our shoulder side because there's not as much space to fill, even for a tall person. On the chest side, there's we need a long screw for various reasons. I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, while we're talking about this shoulder side, the screw that goes into the shoulder side, let me show you something. If you are a shortish person like I am, I'm five foot two, and my neck is average for a five foot two person, I guess. Um, but I need this shortened as much as I can. So the temptation is to screw these feet until that little bit of the screw is completely buried into this housing right there. 
so that it's completely flush. That's what I want to do. You can't for two reasons. First of all, it starts to run into this piece right there. Now that could be worked around. It could easily be worked around with some needle nose pliers. If you have any mechanical inclination, there's a way to make sure that all those threads get buried. It's not advisable for two reasons. First of all, well, you'll, you'll scratch, <laughs> you'll scratch your, your black paint off. That's not a big deal. You can only go a few more turns and then it won't go any further. Don't figure out a way to make it go further because once you put it on your violin, this piece, big piece of metal right there is going to gouge the back of your violin if you succeed in sinking this foot all the way, making those threads uh, go all the way up into that housing. So stop right there or you'll gouge the heck out of your violin. Okay, now the second reason that you really can't go any further than that, well, no, I take that back. You could go further than that, but look what's happening. The end of my screw is already up against the hook. And so if I were to do it any further, I would have to increase my hook even more to make room for that screw. So even though this isn't gonna gouge my violin because I'm not gonna go any further than that. I highly recommend if you're trying to get as, this gap as short as possible, this part, part right here, take the cap off of the screw. Ugh. If you need to, you can bend the hook out of the way. Um, so take that cap off and take a little hacksaw and shorten that screw. And here's why I want you to do that, because I'm going to try to talk you into minimizing the severity of this curve. It's the severity of the curve that locks you into place. And it's, you don't realize it, but there's little moments and little reasons that you want to make small adjustments in the angle of the shoulder rest. And if it's locked, because of this screw forcing you into this extreme curve, then you will experience the main drawback of this shoulder rest, and that's being locked into one position. So take a hacksaw, or take your shoulder rest to Lowe's or Home Depot or Ace Hardware, and ask them to saw off two or three millimeters off of that screw. I'm going to take a little miniature hacksaw and do that right now, and then I'll see you back in this video. Okay, so it's a new day. I'm back. I got this screw shortened, and so now I first want to show you the standard adjustments you can make with your Bon Musica, not counting the fact that I shortened that screw. That is information for people with shorter necks. I highly recommend shortening that puppy so that you can elongate this curve a little further, a little flatter. That changed the angle significantly. And remember the, the danger of sinking this foot too far up is that it brings this metal piece really close to the back of your violin. Like I probably have one or two millimeters between of airspace between this and my violin. I, that's not enough because if you lift your shoulder or if you squeeze a little bit when you're playing, that will dig into your violin. So I would probably sacrifice, unfortunately, and lift this up two more turns, and that which puts it a little bit higher on my neck, but it's better than a gouge in the back of your violin. Okay, so when you are using a shoulder rest, you've got three basic axes that you have control over. I mean, that's a simplification, but just for the sake of simplification, <laughs> we have the level of the scroll. So the height of the scroll. Most teachers teach their students to keep the violin horizontal to the floor. With a little variation, either way is fine, but aim for just horizontal with the floor. The other axis is the tilt of the violin. 
Some people like a, an extreme tilt, some don't. This is gonna impact your bow arm. If you're tilted too much, your bow is gonna hit your belly or your leg when you're on the E string. If it's tilted not enough or too flat, your bow arm will have to go up really high when you're on the G string. I like to have a little play in the tilt of my violin so that I can adapt for my playing conditions. Okay, so that's axis two, or the, the second axis. And then finally, the angle of the violin out from the body. Um, and this is, this is determined by the length of your bow arm primarily, because my bow arm, I'm 5'2", like I said, I'm short, so I hold my violin more to the front so that when I'm on the G string, I can still reach the tip of my bow with a straight bow. If I put my violin out to this angle, which a lot of people do, it would be virtually impossible. Even if I let go of these two fingers, I couldn't get a straight bow on the G string. So see how the angle of the violin affects the angle of the bow. So a lot of these adjustments will be dictated by your physique, by your personal geometry. Now, some physical attributes that will impact your choices of chin rest and uh, shoulder rest is your neck length. How much space do you have between your collarbone and your jaw? Your shoulder shape. My shoulders are so narrow and so sloping I practically don't have shoulders <laughs> and that means I have a lot of space to fill in under here to get my violin to stay put. Some people have real square shoulders, some people have really fleshy shoulders. Just study your shoulder shape and your neck length. Um, your chest. I have a student with a chest that just sinks in. Whether it's poor posture or not, I kind of think it is, but it's ingrained in him. He's 65 years old and it, he's just sunken. So he, he needs extra height on the chest side of his shoulder rest. Otherwise, his violin tilts like crazy unless we artificially boost that side up. So the shape of your chest, and then of course your overall height, like I mentioned before, your arm length is going to impact this axis a lot. Now, one word of caution, um, do not elevate the level of your violin to take up your neck length. Those are two separate functions and a lot of people make that mistake. You, that's why the collarbone is a really good marker for where the violin should be Everything above the collarbone is the job of the chin rest. Everything under the collarbone is the job of the shoulder rest. Okay, just keep that little rule in mind. And, and if you were to use a shoulder rest to take up all of your neck length, what that forces is it forces your bow arm to have to go unnaturally high. And it also forces your violin arm to play um, higher than it should have to and it can create pain and shoulder problems. All right, so now let's talk about the standard adjustments that you can make on the Kuhn. You can raise or lower the screws depending on your personal physical attributes. Raising the shoulder screw is going to fill in this space if you have really a really tall neck, you may need to raise that screw. A lot of people do. I'm the opposite end of the spectrum and I needed to lower it. If you raise or lower the chest screw, that is going to directly impact the tilt of your violin. So just adjust that screw till you get to the position that you prefer. Okay, so that's the screws. Um, You've got, on both feet, you have this function of the swivel. They turn like so, both of them do. That's really nice because suppose you got the shoulder rest on but it's sitting like this on your body 
And so it constantly feels like it either wants to fall until it's flat or it's just not, it's just not seating properly. That's a simple fix. Just change the swivel until it seats perfectly with your body. Okay, so that's the swivel. You've got, of course, the shape that you make the curve on the shoulder. Totally malleable. Now, don't be afraid to use pliers. If you use just your hands, it won't let you bend the extreme edges. But if you can take some pliers, you can move this curve from here out even further to here. So I could flatten this out and then I could coax this shoulder rest to bend a little bit later, like so. Now, I don't really want to do that because I had it where I wanted it, so now I have to move it back. And if you do this too much, yeah, you'll mangle your shoulder rest and it won't look nice. So I'm sacrificing the beauty of my shoulder rest for the sake of this video. See, it, the pliers left a dent. <laughs> um, but I can move it back to where I wanted it. Okay, so that's about where I wanted my curve. And as I play, as I put it up on my violin, there'll be high spots. You know when you go to the dentist and you get a tooth filled and they ask you to bite and you feel where the high spots are and sometimes they put a colored uh, ink on your teeth so that it marks where the high spots are. That's where you're, this is what you're doing now. You're searching for high spots or aggravating spots. You find where they are and you bend it to try to alleviate the high spot or the aggravation. Okay, so that's the, sh the shoulder side of the curve. I already kind of alluded to what this part of the curve is for. This can also impact the tilt of your violin. You can use that bendable portion to impact uh, the tilt of your violin, but m even more so for cases like a concave chest, you might want to lift that up higher so that it really boosts, gives you a boost. Now look, that is not sitting nicely on my chest. So I would say to dictate the tilt of your violin by using the height of the screw and then shape this bendable portion to meld with your chest shape. Now let me show you something that a lot of people also don't realize. You, it's, you don't just have the choice of bending the shoulder rest out this way. You have the choice of bending it, twisting it into a slant and a figure eight style bend. And that can really accommodate the slant that we're trying to get our violin to grip onto. Um, if I slant it this way, that fits onto the, the slant of my chest much better than if it was just on straight. So play around with that. You can truly get a custom fit with this shoulder rest. Now let's talk about the final adjustment, which is the little screws. I'm gonna ask you to ignore a really ugly hole that I made temporarily because we're gonna talk about that in a second. So ignore that. That's for emergencies if you need that special adjustment, okay? So we have basically three pairs of holes. We've got this pair, and that seems to put the violin, the, the shoulder rest into, oops, that puts the shoulder rest into a three-quarter size. That makes it a, a, a smaller shoulder rest. Okay, so you're probably not gonna use that unless you play on a three-quarters. Then you've got this pair. That's the standard straight up, see how the foam pads are aligned? That is the standard, and I'd start with that and see if you can make that work, because it works for most people, actually. 
okay? If you don't like that, or if you still feel like the hook wants to fall off your shoulder, if you have narrow shoulders or, or whatever the reason, then there's this pair of holes right here. They're just off center a little bit. That throws your, your pad off center a little bit. See, that throws the pad off to the side a little bit, but guess what else it does? It throws the pad up on your shoulder a few millimeters. So it'll bring the pad in from feeling like it's on the edge of your shoulder. It'll bring it in slightly. Okay, now if that's not enough and you still feel like it's gonna slide off, that's when you can mangle your shoulder rest even more and add this extra hole here. Now I really screwed this up because I got it slightly in the wrong place. <laughs> so then I had to enlarge the hole to get the screws to fit through. But watch what happens. So here's the standard right there, okay? Now we keep this hole of the standard and then we swing the other bolt through the new ugly hole that I made and look what shape my shoulder rest is now. Okay, so what that just did is it brought the shoulder rest extremely in, right up onto my the higher part of my shoulder, so it doesn't even remotely feel like it's gonna fall off, even with my flattened curve. This is gonna give me a lot of freedom, flexibility, and security, and remove any fear of the shoulder rest falling off my narrow shoulders. Okay, so that's one option you can create for yourself. Just be careful because you can ruin your shoulder rest if you do it wrong.